Yo. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast where a behavioral scientist examines what it's like to live a humorous life. Glimpse into the lives of the funniest people in entertainment, business, and science as your host, Dr. Peter McGraw, explores their habits, motivations, and secrets to success. Get ready to fire up your brain and your funny bone. Now, here's your host. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast that looks at the lives of funny people. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's guest is Madison Shepard. Madison is a stand-up writer and actor. She's appeared on Comedy Central's The New Negroes. She's performed at SF Sketch Fest, Broke LA, Laugh Riot, Girl Festival. <laughs> <laughs> and she studied acting at Los Angeles County High School for the Arts and the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in London. Evidently, that cost a lot of money. It was very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Madison is soon to release her debut EP, Good Night Silver Lake. Yes. Welcome, Madison. Hi, thank you. So, Madison, if you weren't working... So I know you don't know this question. Okay. Because you didn't know the name of the podcast. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, you know what? Danielle Perez and I have been friends for years. She recommended you. I'm like, yes, we've been best friends for like, she recommended years. you. And I was like, yes, so yeah. we're, we're even, we're great. <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't working as a stand up writer or actor, what would you be doing? Um, that's something that I think about a lot because I'm like, <laughs> at what point do I just like throw in the towel? Um, I'm, I'm not there yet today, but you know, something doesn't go, if I bomb tonight, I may be like, maybe I should go to school. The thought did pass my mind that maybe I would be like today, like a massage therapist. Okay. Because it's a shorter, I hate school and it's like a short amount of like studying to like become one. And so I think I would be, and you can make your own schedule and blah, 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 blah. Now, would you be one of these <laughs> massage therapists who, who talk to their clients? No, but maybe happy endings. You know what I mean? <laughs> that seems to be where the money is anyways, right? <laughs> like rub and tug? Maybe. I don't know. I'll come to you. Or you'll come to me. Uh, <laughs> Can I talk about that on here? <laughs> it, it, this podcast does have an explicit rating. Great. So great, you're safe. Great. People have said much, much, much worse. So um, so you're performing tonight. I am. We're, this won't get released for a long time, but but still, but where, where, what are you doing tonight? Tonight I'm doing, they have a, sh a comedy show at the Kibitz Room, which oh, is... Oh, you're doing Nicole Blaine's show. Yes. Yeah. Nicole is a prior guest. Ah. Nicole's yes. great. She is. I like her. I love her. Yeah. Will so, you, you give her my best? I will. Absolutely. With pleasure. So we'll get back to your massage therapy. Right. Le legal or not. <laughs> Uh, Let's legalize have you, sex have work. Have you done? Um, have you done the kibitz room before? I, you know, I've never done it before, but I, so I'm excited to do it tonight. Are you doing? Are you doing new material? Or are you doing strong material? Well, because I just did like an EP of basically. It's 20 minutes. It's like two showcase sets, like mm -hmm. the kind of the two that I generally do in Los Angeles. I am doing one chunk that is on that album and then stuff that I was working on prior to putting that set list together for the album. Mm -hmm. So it's newer. I'm, I'm the type of person who will sit on material for a while mm -hmm. and just like run the fuck out of it. <laughs> um, so new it's there is newer material in the sense that it was written in the last like eight months okay so that's <laughs> so i only ask that because the the particular night i was there which i i couldn't tell you if it was a regular night sure. or not had i think a fairly set of accomplished comedians come yeah. through camera esposito's on this one tonight oh that's fun yeah yeah and but they were doing a lot. I felt like they were doing a lot of new stuff. Some oh. people doing some really like half baked ideas, Great. premise type stuff. Oh, that's fun! I love a workout room. Well, the problem was the audience wasn't <laughs> picking up what they were putting sure. down. Yeah, that can be a problem. And so it was funny because it's like comedian after comedian came up and mm, faltered. Let's say, mm -hmm. and you know, and and, and then turn the room against them by complaining about the audience. Yes. <laughs> which, you know, I think that happens in LA more than in other places. Yeah. And, uh, but it was really fascinating. So the last, I wish I could remember the gentleman's name who, who finished. He's a comic from Memphis. Okay. Um, just a 
Yeah, you know, he he was great. You know, mm-hmm. he just comes up there and crushes it. Yeah. You know, and and it was such an interesting experience where like everybody was like all right, folks. Okay, folks. What's wrong? All this stuff. And then this dude just gets up all shucks and just Does had told material? a story about a per- porcupine living in his house. Wow. And killed. Yeah. And you're like, mm, not sure. Yeah. I, I think people are quick. To- it didn't help me sitting in the front with my arms crossed. Sure. I'm sure. Analyzing yeah. jokes as a scientist. Sure. But I, I feel like <laughs> oftentimes people will like shit on the audience, but it's like, we also have to take, I always think it's like three or four things, right? It's me. Mm -hmm. It's something in my timing. My timing might be off. My delivery might be off. My energy might be off, uh, whatever Mm -hmm. for the room. It might be too big, too little, too slow to this. It could literally be the audience. Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There, that is a fact. They mean just not like what you're doing or they might be, sick of sitting in traffic, whatever. Mm -hmm. It could also be the venue Mm -hmm. and it could also be, um, just, you know, the luck of the draw. You know what I mean? It's like, it could be anything. So I think that is, so it's when you point these out, it it reminds me of how people say to me, um, you can't really study comedy. You can't really dissect it and understand it because, because I think that if you're a, a comic, you feel these whims, you know, a shift in the wind and Mm -hmm. suddenly the laughs evaporate, you know? Yeah. And so as a result, it feels, you know, a lot more ephemeral, a little bit more magical, uncertain, random and so on. Although, and of course my response is that science is really good at filtering out systematic, random and finding a signal in the noise Yeah. in order to, uh, well, I think some questions. people, it's, <laughs> there is magic in performance in general, I think just because it is the nature of it is like to channel something otherworldly and then to like bring that through yourself and then like put it out into the world is there is something there that we can't quite explain, but honestly jokes are pretty mathematical. And like, if you hit your time, like timing is mathematical. And I think you can say kind of anything. It could be like a plain sentence, but if you time it correctly, you make a joke out of it. So I think it's comics trying to like big themselves to be like, Oh, it's the magic. You can't study it. No, you probably can. Yeah. And people should <laughs> stand up is relatively new. You know what I mean? As like a art form, like, of course, why not study it? Yes. We see eye to eye. Yes. And systemize it. <laughs> and I, I will get off this. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm like, I will die on this hill, but I, I don't really want to, which is, I just don't think maybe you, maybe you can convince me otherwise that critiquing the audience for not laughing is in any way a good strategy. Oh, it's like when you're fucking someone and you're like, why aren't you coming? Why aren't you coming? And it's like, what are you doing to engender that? You know, sorry, I just bumped the mic with my mouth, but yeah, you can't like shout at somebody to come when you're, yeah, come on. You have to figure out a different way. Madison, don't quit being a stand up. <laughs> Okay. okay. I won't. Because that that's <laughs> the kind of, I would, uh, um, so I, I, I don't think I would come up with that analogy, mm-hmm. um, in part because as a professor, I, I probably can't go that off color. Sure. But secondly, I don't think I could come up that with that analogy that quickly Oh. in order t- for the comic effect of it all. Shh, okay. So, well, thank you. I like it. So I, I was doing a little bit of research on you, admittedly mm-hmm. not, not enough. That's fine. Um, <laughs> There's not a lot out there. But I, you have a joke or you, you made a comment in one of your, your um, videos about being raised by a white mom in the hood. Yes, that's true. Yes. So tell me about your white mom and your hood. I mean, okay. What's the story? So my mom, uh, she's very, she's very nice lady. Um, (laughs) she's, 
you know what? She's not with us, which is a joke from Eric. Was like, she's not with us, but don't worry. She's not dead. We could just talk about her, but she's, she'll probably listen to this. Um, she, Does she have a Google <laughs> alert set up for your name. I'm sure she, okay. she, she loves me and is like very incredibly supportive. So she, hi, is, Madison's mom. Hi, Molly. Uh, Molly Louise. Uh, my mom, um, my parents met doing a show. I'm um, doing theater in Dallas. And so when they got together, um, you know, they sort of dated on and off and whoops, <laughs> I came along. Uh, and my dad was pretty much not prepared to be a parent and yeah. was super not around. So my mom, you know, with a degree in theater and a half black child, uh, had to make some choices living in Dallas, Texas, which, mm. uh, still is very segregated, very racist place. Like there are places that she couldn't have my baby picture on her desk because she could lose her job because she has a black child. I see. Like race is like a big issue there still and whatever. So, <clears throat> you know, she raised me in the hood, uh, in Oak cliff, which, uh, you know, we didn't know this at the time, but was like slowly starting to gentrify and it's, it's very gentrified now, but the the roots and uh, uh, seeds for that were planted in the 80s and 90s when I was a kid there. So a lot of like artists like my mom and like uh, a lot of queer people move there and, and, you know, slowly it sort of developed into this whole other, it's a very she-she, it's more she-she than it was when I lived there. Like you couldn't get a cab to take you from the airport to Oak Cliff back in the day. <laughs> like it's an expensive fare and they were like, well, it's late at night, I'm not going to the hood. So yeah, so she raised me there by herself. Um, and it, you know, I have, my life is always kind of these like dualities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I lived in the hood, but my grandmother lived in a trailer on her sister's cattle ranch. So I spent a lot of time mm -hmm. being in the hood, but I spent a lot of time herding cows and fishing and shooting guns and so skinning you, you animals. You had like a red blue dichotomy. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. yeah. Like where it was like, just, you know, my mom was very also like I, w I took ballet growing up. I, you know, played violin. I always did theater, you mm -hmm. know? So there's always been this kind of, my life has always been this way where it's like both this and that, mm -hmm. you know? So I think I've always kind of been a little of this, a little of that my whole life and growing up with a white mom. And at the time when we moved there, it was a black neighborhood, but by the time we left, it was like majority Latino. So like that was also like an interesting moment in my life, just in terms of like racial identity and mm -hmm. how I identified where I fit in, in the society that I was living in. Um, so yeah, so it's a whole, I, I haven't even cracked the, the shell of the creme brulee of that. It's like, there's so much there. I'll probably write a book about it or something. Someday. And you have jokes about this. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I have probably like 15 minutes on my mom okay. <laughs> and like growing up in Texas. Um, I had a, I, you know, I think there's something, I mean, most people don't grow up in a place that changes while they're there, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I had the same thing. The uh, the reverse of sorts of white neighborhood mm -hmm. that that experienced white flight, mm -hmm. and so by the time I left was mostly black. Yeah, and um, for, for as a as a white kid, it was a good experience. Sure, because you know you, I think like the average white person really just doesn't have that much. Um, exposure mm -hmm. to people who are different, you know. I mean, just the, right. the nature it's of the factors, like that. <laughs> yeah, seg yes. segregation. <laughs> yeah, and um, it's you know, it's I think eye opening and empathy causing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it also makes people realize that we're all kind of the same. It's in a way, like not to like paint it with that brush. I realize that cultural and socioeconomic and racial things do exist. However, it's. It, as somebody who experienced that, I can tell you that like it, it, I'm not mystified by Latino people because I grew up around Latino people and like it, it like left an imprint on me that was so strong. And I feel it's like made my life better. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like it's made my life more beautiful and enriched having grown up with people, um, who are not exactly like me. 
I agree. You know? Well, the, I think the way to, so the way scientists would, would talk about this. So I think this gets discussed mostly when it comes to gender mm-hmm. is that, it, that we tend to focus on differences, mm-hmm. how, how men and women are different, for example. Yeah. But if you were to plot whatever the things that you're measuring in terms of differences, you see two bell shaped curves, you mm-hmm. know, with some people f- far on one side, far on the other side, most people in the middle. And yes, there's a gap between the means of those two things, but there's more overlap between the two than there are not yeah. because, you know, we're living in the same world with similar types of problems and, right. and so on. That said, you're right. You know, culture, gender, orientation, et cetera, uh, socioeconomic status, et cetera, moderates a lot of these kinds of mm-hmm. kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so you, so this duality idea, I think is a very interesting one. I think that when you start looking for it in comedy, you find it a lot mm-hmm. in the sense that you find people who don't quite fit in. Mm-hmm. And so they don't fit in for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they don't fit in because they don't like to play by the rules. Sure. Um, but another way they don't fit in is they're just a little, you know, it's, it's a, co- it's a common comedy trope, right? Fish sure. out of water, mm-hmm. right? You know, freaky Friday, right? Let's just make the daughter, the mom and the mom, the daughter and comedy ensues, yes. you know, in that sense. Mm-hmm. And so you were sort of living, I don't want to say, I don't want to say your life is a comedy trope no, because but, I haven't, you know, but you know, uh, trading places, mm-hmm. you know, you can, you, it just goes on, you know, you, you can find this everywhere. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the kid who's fishing and hunting on the weekends and, mm-hmm. and hanging out in this gentrifying neighborhood on the weekdays and vice versa. Yeah. You know, it's, I would say that that, yeah, that's definitely true. All, all, I, a lot of comics are outsiders in, in some way. That's how you get to kind of have the overview, which I think is like good and bad. It's hard sometimes when you have to have like a strong POV on something when you're like, but like for me, you know, again, I'm, I'm mixed. So I'm like, I'm black and I'm white, but I've been with my rich cousins and I've been at the trailer and I've lived without electricity and I've, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, seen the helicopters put the light in my window because they're looking for somebody who's jumping fences because mm-hmm. they robbed a bank or whatever the fuck is happening. <laughs> I don't know. Just like wild shit, right? But like, I, that's a common thing in comics. Absolutely. That and like having like a, a home where it's like one parent or like divorced parents mm-hmm. or like uh, two parents in the home, but one is like completely absent emotionally, spiritually, intellectually or whatever. Um, that's something that we all share. Yeah. This, I think it's kind of, I, I, it's like this idea of perspective changing, Mm -hmm. you know, comics don't create laughs by, um, how do I say this? Like without being provocative. Yeah. And and so having either, you know, having a different perspective that, um, that they can make in some way. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, or they have the same perspective um, but they find a way to, to, to make it a bit agonizing and yeah. some, you know, in some sense there has to be some, something that's there. And I, I, I get a kick out of watching comics who do this, mm-hmm. you know, everybody thinks X, I'm going to say Y and mm-hmm. I'm going to, you know, I'm smart enough and I'm likable enough and I'm everything enough to, to create laughs out of this thing that is at first blush not the, you know, not the right thing to be saying, sure. not the normal thing to be saying, Love not it. the normal perspective. And so Love it. do you have a, do you have a particular joke that sort of feels like that, that you, that you're, you're essentially making an argument for something that the average person in the audience at first blush wouldn't agree with? Oh, to like change somebody's mind? Yeah, well, I think or... I, my guess is, is probably to get a laugh first, but Oh God. I, I love Mr. X. I like, or things that are like, um, oh, okay. So I have a, I have a joke right now that is going to be on the EP that is about new metal and how much I loved new metal as a preteen. And I'd like go through all the examples of like why I loved it and who I was at the time. Okay. So you're going to have to help this guy. <laughs> so I know 
So new I metal, heavy metal. Okay, so new metal happened in ninety five, ninety six when Corn released their debut album. <laughs> okay, I was in gra- I was heading into grad school, so those years are. A, I'm sure a cultural was, blur for me. That's fine. So like, it's just like heavy metal and hip hop together. Ah, it's I see. Corn, okay. it's Limp Bizkit, it's oh, yes. Linkin Park, it's that, okay. you know these kind of bands. So that's new metal. Yes. I know. I know. I know the. <laughs> I didn't know what they were. Yes, that's the. I know that's those, the name of. The, I know those guys mm-hmm. i mean you system know. of a down oh, yeah, slipknot yeah. all of these kind right. of bands are i, I are dusted metal. off a system of the down song recently love system of a down the, what's the one what's the song the one about the guy who kissed his mother goodbye and chop suey no i don't think that's it i think it's system of the down maybe i'm misremembering hmm. it they were really into oh rhyming. it's a youth of a nation is oh. that not system of the down I don't know. Don't make me sing the chorus. Okay, that's fine. I'll put it in the exhibits if I can find it. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. Okay, so I didn't mean to interrupt because I just... Uh, so, new metal. New metal, yeah. And, you know, I think one of the, one of the things that I, I... I like to say things that are shocking, but also true, but all like kind of you didn't think I was going to go there. So, I'm like, you know, I used to cut you know, the crotch is out of pantyhose and wear it as a shirt and like all this other stuff. It's hard to explain it, but I'll try it. But then, you know, the, the end of the, the like real like punch of it is like, you know, I just was very angry and opinionated for somebody who hadn't been raped yet, you know, which is like true and accurate and probably true of a lot of women in the audience and men too. That's not to say, you know, whatever. Um, so like, I don't know if that's what you're asking for, but I like that kind of stuff for me where it's like, I'm saying something very true and it's, it happens and it's like, just like a little flash of like, boom. I just had it when you said that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I, I, I don't know. I, I love a misdirect. I try to do them more. I'm trying to think of more. Oh, wait. You can cut all of this. This is the joke. I don't, I don't edit, so great. Okay, well, so I I had a so I had this joke about you know I, my boyfriend my uh, my ex boyfriend blocked me on social media, mm-hmm. which is hard because how can I ask him to move out of my apartment? Ah, that's probably yes. like my favorite one, uh-huh. but it's a fun one. It's quicker. It didn't bring up rape, but you know, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, I um. Yeah, that's a fun one. Yeah, I lo- I like that that's kind of one. stuff. That seems like the kind of joke that you can build out mm-hmm. in a bunch of different ways. I did. I yeah, I, I like that kind of because it's a great. It's an in. Yeah, it's just like um, it's a breakup joke. It's letting you know this man still lives at my house. Mm-hmm. You know, the the next beat of that is like. Um, I love true crime, but it's a problem because I, I have this man sleeping on my couch because I keep thinking I'm going to see him stand over me with a knife mm-hmm. and, and just watch him still not have enough commitment to take my life. You know, <laughs> like it's that it like kind of goes on like that. Like that, that was a lot of fun and painful to write. <laughs> was there a kernel of truth to that story about him it. not moving out? Yeah. He, he and lived the blocking. Uh huh. Yeah. I was nervous and I love true crime and, um, Yeah. He did want to commit to me. That was a problem. That was the only part that was a lie about that. I see. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. I think that idea, like, you know, people talk a lot about, about truth and comedy. And I think that the issue is, is like, that's half right. Mm -hmm. Right. There's, I think the, the issue, you know, when people say, oh, it's, it's funny because it's true. It's not, it's actually really not the right way to think about truthfulness in comedy. I think the way to think about it is with regard to authenticity in comedy. That is that the, the things that you don't want to talk about are the things that are often funny, mm-hmm. you know? So a truthful story of going to Seven Eleven and buying a pack of cigarettes is not funny, even though it, it, you could be, perfectly accurate with it it's the thing that happened and is real that you go i really don't want to talk about that that's Mm -hmm. the thing that i think often makes good comedy fodder the things that's embarrassing the things yeah painful yes indeed yeah all right so we're gonna we're gonna pass on this massage therapist stuff i really hope you don't (laughs) give up comedy just just quite just quite yet yeah (laughs) <laughs> so, so, um, the woman who, you know, from Texas went to, um, 
a high school for the arts mm-hmm. here in Los Angeles. Yeah. So following in your family's mm-hmm. lineage of, of artists, mm-hmm. it sounds to me that you had that artistic streak rather early yeah. in, in life. Yeah. Ex- exposed to ideas and. Oh and yeah. So well, my mom was a playwright, so I was at every rehearsal. I was at every read through. I was at openings, closings. Mm-hmm. Um, I was around a lot of theater and theater makers growing up. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think I had a choice but to turn into an artist myself. I I mean, maybe I could have, but I I don't think that that's how I was groomed. (laughs) I think I was kind of groomed into being one as well, which is fine. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. I mean, look, you get one life. You might as well do something interesting with it. I suppose. Yeah. Could use with some more money though. I'll tell you that much. (laughs) Well, you know, I just was having this conversation. Um, you know, I have a bit of a love affair with Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the things that I, I like about this city and other cities like it, um, the, the one coming to mind is Dubai. I, I, I spent some time in Dubai teaching there. And I, I like the same thing about those places. It's the place that people go to pursue their dreams. Yeah. As imperfect as those dreams may be. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the, the person I was discussing it with, you know, she said, oh, you know, I, I think it's just kind of sad. All these people coming here mm. and failing. And I and I and of course, and, and the answer is, well, yeah, of course. I mean, that's that's unfortunate. Sure. And and. Yeah, plenty of them fail because, you know, it's a big funnel and mm-hmm. and and few spots and so on. But I credit the I credit folks for that type of yeah. optimism, that type of risk and belief uh, in yourself give, and too. Exactly, and giving yourself a chance as imperfect as the context in the situation may be. And, and and frankly sometimes given how overmatched some people are at at yeah. it, you know, that they may be, they may be unskilled and unaware, but yet that, that optimism, I find it uplifting. I find it inspiring. Yeah. It's I, one of the, I mean, it's beautiful and it's also tragic Yes, in some ways. It can be very tragic. I mean, Hollywood is, you know, filled with stories of people killing themselves over their clippings and you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And stuff like that. It's, you know, killing themselves off of the Hollywood sign. There's just like a, a, a hard, uh, something that's very hard about it and is great grading and grinding. But if you can stick it out, then it's not so bad. Yes. But yeah, we, we were talking about a comic before, before who I've known for a long time, who I know, I knew him when he had a car, then I knew him when he didn't have a car, then mm-hmm. I knew when he had a car mm-hmm. again, and now has a TV show. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, yeah. The, you know, there's ups and downs and sure are. that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, so you went to this high school, mm-hmm. an arts high school. So my only, my only experience with the arts high school is the television show Fame. Yes. <laughs> and, so of course, is that high school is the portrayal of arts high school in fame? I mean, this is maybe before your time. Yeah, this is slightly before my time. I watched the movie. Um, is it accurate? Yeah, I mean, there are parts of it that are very okay. much that. Um, is Glee? I guess is Glee a um, arts high school? No, they're just a regular high school. Oh, they are. Okay. I mean, I I found arts high, arts high was really hard because it was the first time I was around that many white people. <laughs> And, you know, coming from like, also coming from Texas and like, like I moved to Los Angeles on September 4th, 2001, and my mom hadn't moved here yet. So, you know, within a week, 9-11 happens Mm -hmm. and like the nation kind of goes crazy. So it was just like a weird time (laughs) for sure um, to be a kid. Uh, But Arts High... My school is very, very good. They based, uh, you know, a lot of the teachers who taught there also taught at the different universities all over Los Angeles, Mm -hmm. um, USC, UCLA, CSUN, um, all of that. So my days were broken up with like four hours of academics and four to six hours of arts training every day for four years. Mm. So by the time I left, I had had like a college level actors training. I'd done Suzuki method, which is like a lot of stomping and 
whatever. I had done a lot of like voice training, you know what I mean? A lot of, you know, I was trained in Shakespeare and Chekhov and Commedia del Arte and all these things. Mm. So it was kind of this very enriching. I also took as little academic classes as I could get away with. And so I took a lot of film classes and TV classes. Um, actually I won an Annenberg scholarship while I was there for TV production. So I, I really thrived. I hate school, but I did, I did like the arts education. Like I, I loved it. Um, it was hard and challenging mm -hmm. and unfair a lot, but why so, um, you know, there's just like, a there's class issues. You know, we were living in hotels, um, me and my mom and, uh, until I was like a junior at the end of junior year, we got like our first like permanent address in Los Angeles. But before that we were living in like Roach motels all over the city. And so having to move around a lot also like there were times when I was the only person employed in the household. Mm. Um, and I was also a high school student and working part time. And so that was, um, tricky often. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would, uh, you know, be like, you know, the highlight of my weekend was eating moon pies or some dumb shit. And then I'd be sitting next to somebody who's like, well, we took my boyfriend's helicopter to da 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 da, mm -hmm. you know? So there was just like a huge, it was hard in that way. And I think that, and this is still true for artists. I think that if you're not having to worry about the day to day problems of like, where am I going to sleep? Where am I going to eat? Where am I going to bathe? Do I have enough money to support myself? Blah, blah, blah. If you don't, ha if you ha are financially stable, you don't have these added pressures on you. Right. Mm -hmm. And that takes away time from creating art, from getting better, from getting stronger in your chosen field. So I felt like a lot of the kids who were more well off and frankly, well connected in the industry. Some of them were at the Emmys last night. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, those kids had a different career trajectory than like someone like me who's coming from like a, I'm not coming from a deficit, but I'm coming from a lower place. You know what I mean? Financially. So that I felt was a huge struggle in my training. And, um, it's still, you know, class still is a big issue for me. Yeah, I, I agree. I didn't, when you said unfair, I wasn't sure where, where it was originating from, but uh -huh. I, I completely agree. As a kid, you don't understand this, right? Sh sure. Yeah. As an adult, I still kind of don't. Well, I think, you know, uh, to reflect back, you know, what you're saying is, I think we have a tendency to sort of romanticize the struggle of art sport, science, mm -hmm. business, et cetera. But when you really take a good, hard look at it, it's, it's the, the lack of constraints that mm -hmm. are more beneficial than the presence of constraints. Yeah. Generally the case, right? So if you're well rested, if you're well nourished, if you're healthy, if you're free of worry and anxiety, mm -hmm. that leads to more creativity than the opposite. Yeah. Um, I forget where I saw this and I can't remember if it was, I'm thinking about professional sport, but um, if it was basketball or football, it might've even been football. You know, we have this tendency to think about like football players coming from really underprivileged backgrounds Very. in part because most football players are black mm -hmm. um, in the professional ranks, especially. However, I think someone did an analysis and finds that a surprising amount of them come from, more middle class kinds of families. Interesting. And, so and you start to unpack that and you go, okay, well, why, why would that be the case? And you're like, well, middle class families have more resources, mm -hmm. you know, and so you can dedicate more time to the sport because you don't have to get a job. Exactly. You can and, hang out after school and a, and a game that is built on being highly physical and athletic, you benefit from being eating better and having mm -hmm. better coaching and better facilities and wow. all these kinds of things. And so, you know, I don't, if, if it's, if it's present there, I don't see why it wouldn't be present in the arts. Yeah. And then the second one, which I think you're, you're absolutely right about is the, the role of parents. Mm -hmm. And so not only, right. Like, so, you know, I'm getting old enough now where mm -hmm. I'm starting to see the kids of famous people. Yes. 
in, in the arts and entertainment, mm -hmm. you know? And so now they may, they may not be always be as good as the parent, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? But they, they're there. Yeah. And you know, it's like the parent is able to open doors for them, make introductions, the brand name. Mm -hmm. And then also the parent is just there to cut a learning curve, mm -hmm. you know, and plus the resources that these wealthy parents have. Right. Better training, more opportunity. You don't have to go bag groceries down at the supermarket. Right. And so on. Exactly. I mean, I tweeted this over the weekend rather saltily, but like, I kind of can't take your Emmy bid seriously if you've never had to pay your own rent. Mm. You know what I mean? If mom and dad have always paid your rent and you've never had to like worry at the 27th of the month, like, Ooh, am I going to do it? Do I have to choose between gas and food? I kind of, I can't relate, you know? Mm -hmm. But maybe that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> so do you... Yeah, okay. So, well, this is this is an interesting question. So how much should the art be judged by the advantages or disadvantages of the artist? I mean, I, I think we do have a tendency to really enjoy the stories associated, you know, so... I'm, you know, I'm on my Twitter feed, you know, whenever like a, a famous person's name pops up, I'm always worried they're dead, but sometimes it's just their birthday. Uh huh. So was, today was Bruce Springsteen's birthday. Oh, okay. So and he didn't so die. He did not okay, die. Got he's, it. he's 70 and you know, he's strong like a horse or an ox yeah. or whatever the saying is. Any case, you know, that, that's a guy who, who, you know, came from pain. Like his, mm -hmm. his, you know, it's, it's a nice story of his music coming from pain and, and, you know, and so on. And so that enhances, the story associated with it, but no one gives a shit that his music came from pain. If his music's not very good. Sure. So, so I'm curious about that. Like, I guess it is a, it's an added, right. It's a nice added element to watching or listening. Well, it's just about like thing. showing your work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? On the mathematical equation, right? Like okay. show your work. Let, what, what was your process? And if your process didn't involve, like sweating it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I go, well, okay. I'm, I, I, for me as an artist and also somebody who consumes, I sort of care a little bit less. Your career milestones for me mean a little bit less because I know that for every one of you, there are thousands of people who are better yeah, than you or just who, as good. That's right. Yeah. Who, because they didn't have those same opportunities aren't in your position mm -hmm. because I also think that it's kind of the nature of the thing. Like, sure, we're all individuals, but at least in the industry, like we can sort of rotate a new one. <laughs> like, Every so often. Yeah. Like, um, there's like a quote from Tu Wong Fu. Thanks for everything. Julie Newmar was like, it's about sex, but it's like anytime one of the lights go out on Broadway, you can just unscrew the light bulb and screw a new one back in. Uh huh. I think it's like that kind of in a way. I see. Mm hmm. Yeah, I um But that's me. I'm very focused on class. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, well, I mean, yeah. given your background that that clearly makes yeah. makes good sense. And obviously it's finding its way into your Yes. Into your work. Slowly I'm starting to I have a I have a lot of I think also I should say I have a lot of shame and weird feelings about being poor and having to lie about that and covering up that now I'm sort of like exhausted by that and have felt like it warped my experience as a person growing up in the world. And so now I'm starting to talk about the actual nitty gritty facts of it a little bit more. So that's also why it's at the forefront of my mind. Well, I'm glad you're doing it. Thanks. So you, as if Los Angeles County High School for the Arts wasn't enough, mm -hmm. you went to London. Mm -hmm. I did. And studied at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. Yeah. Tell me what tell me why. And then did this have a magnifying effect? I mean, I, you know, having London is one of those places, it's you know, expensive, great mm -hmm. international city, mm -hmm. diverse, but also one that's very cla you know, very, very class focused. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, after high school you know, I didn't get my first speaking role in high school until my senior year of high school. I was in the choruses for every show. Like we did four or five productions a year. And so I was constantly, even though I would get callbacks for all the leads, I would be given like no opportunity. And I don't know how much race and how much like 
people's parents donating time and resources to the Mm. school. I don't know what the equation was, but it certainly wasn't talent. So, you know, that sort of soured me on theater, on acting. I didn't see a way for me to get ahead um, or to even have an opportunity. Also during this time, this is like, you know, we have a lot of body positivity now, but there was not that then. And so I was like a size 10, a size eight and being told that I was too fat I see. to act, <laughs> to tell stories. So it was all sort of like a fucked up time in my life. And so after high school, I just got a job. I worked, I worked, I didn't go into college until I was 22. And I said, well, okay, you know, I had done, I had quit the theater and I slowly started getting back into doing theater, doing some stage managing. And then I did a lot of work with like Shakespeare in the park here in Los Angeles and just slowly kind of tiptoeing. And I was like, huh, okay, well the actors who I like in this theater company, they went to school and, um, got really strong classical training. And like, I want to do that too, because I love, I love classical theater and I love, poetry it's mathematical it's timing Mm -hmm. it's the things that i love about words um and so anyway so i uh i ended up uh applying to this school based on knowing alumni from the school and then also knowing some of the famous alumni from the school and such uh, such as as anybody judy dench Mm -hmm. Lawrence olivier um a everyone who's in black mirror, like all the like (laughs) stuff dude. many people who I went to school with are in harlots and all the, you know, all this other stuff. So I, I went, um, it should have been a red flag during the callback when they were like, but how are you going to pay for school? Can you tell us what your financial like plan is during the callback for the school? Mm. So I basically, got loans for education, but not for living. So I was going to have to work and I did work and my mom was supplementing that. And then my stepdad lost his job. And so they stopped sending me money. Mm. And so school became really fucking hard. Um, cause it's like you're at school from like seven in the morning to seven at night. And then you have like homework, which is memorizing and analyzing text for hours And I was working like on the weekends and stuff. So I just like sort of dove into this like depressive uh, tailspin of like eating disorders and fucking horrible men. And at the end of the first year, I just left school. So I stayed, but then I I did end up leaving. Um, But then I came to Los Angeles back home, picked up the pieces and I did classical theater here. I ran a company, I Uh wrote plays and I, I was fulfilled for that for a time. And, uh, and yeah, and that's, and that's sort of what leads, you know, that's the precursor to me starting comedy. Okay. So at that point, after having kind of like a failed classical theater, (laughs) I guess, acting career, if you will, and dropping out of college, then I, a couple of years later, I'm a stand up. You know, it's interesting about stand up as a art form is everywhere else. It seems completely acceptable at the very least and oftentimes highly encouraged to get formal training. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, whether it be acting, Mm -hmm. music, whatever it might be, you know, coaching in sport, obviously any sort of higher education for the sciences and so on, everything. Yeah. And except stand up. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, the idea that if you've taken a stand up class, mm-hmm. you know, there's that's joke worthy. That's ridiculous. You can't you know what I mean? And I, I find that I find that really perplexing because I think that class work can be an efficient way to pick up a lot of things and figure out a lot of stuff. I mean, again, assuming two things are present. One is the instruction is competent Mm -hmm. and the other one is that your peers are competent, not all of them, but enough of them yeah, kind of thing. And so, uh, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon within, Mm -hmm. within that. And I think some of it is just like, Oh, that's not how I did it. I just, you know, was grinding it out yeah, Mm -hmm. and figuring it out. And you're like, ah, well, what if you could have taken a class and like cut a year off of your learning curve? Yeah. Would that have been worth it? Mm hmm. 
Uh, I when we um, so when I worked on the Humor Code, um, the book I I published a few years ago, we went and sat in on a class here in LA by this guy named Greg Dean. Okay. And Greg, Greg, I think, and you subscribe to the same idea, which is the the formulaicness of jokes. That is yeah. that he has a system by which you can sort of create jokes, at least a certain style of joke. Yeah. And and I think that once you pick up on that, that can be useful, especially mm-hmm. seeing a lot of new comics construct jokes badly. Yeah. I think that's, that's useful, but it was really fun. The class that we sat in on my co-author and I sat in on was he was just teaching, um, crowd work, mm. how to riff wow. and how, how to do crowd work. And, that's um, interesting. and yeah, I thought that was, uh, you know I mean? you can learn how to do crowd work in a lot of different ways, watching other comics, yeah. trying and failing, experimenting and so on. And he, you know, he had some, Again, some standard lessons. And then in class, people got up and got to do crowd work. And then they got feedback on their crowd work. Interesting. From him and from the crowd, which, uh, which I thought was kind of fun. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I'm the kind of person who would want to take a class. I mean, I, I did take a class. Okay. Um, I obviously, even though I, I hate school, I, uh, so why, why? So this is the third time this has come up. Yeah. Hating school. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, we should talk about it. I, I was always, I, I talk too much. I'm distracting in class. I get bored easily, well, you're, but I love school and I have all those same things. Yeah. I got in a lot of trouble all the time for talking too much and distracting other people and being the class clown and that kind of stuff. I see. Uh, but I, I think I don't like the politics of school and certainly in my schooling experience, like class and money and yes, I see all those things sort of sour. And I'm like, I don't fucking need this. The world is tough mm-hmm. enough. You know, like it's, it's battering my spirit in that way already. I don't need to pay for the privilege of this yeah. uh, reminder that I'm poor. Uh, I, I, if I may, mm-hmm. that sounds like a difficult inner dialogue to have. Mm hmm. If, um, and first of all, I agree with you, right? I, I don't think it, it's not a level playing field, mm-hmm. but then the, the question is if you don't play on the field, mm-hmm. do you further disadvantage yourself? Right. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if anything, my, I feel like my career is, is a slow burn, mm-hmm. you know, like, and everything I've gotten has been because I'm talented Mm -hmm. and I can do it and I wouldn't change my experiences, but I think, you know, money makes everything better. (laughs) You know what I mean? So anyways, I can't believe I actually the stand up class is like the, the last, that's kind of the last thing I've taken an acting class since then, but like, I just can't pay somebody for that for me anymore. Like Mm -hmm. I just am like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to learn it. Um, it, so yeah, I, I, I just am very much like I get disheartened by the experience and maybe I would benefit better from one-on-one tutoring on something if I were to go back to school, but like, yeah. Or vocational training. I don't know. Well, there is, um, there's an alternative model, I think. And well, okay. So let's see. Let's just talk this through for a moment. Sure. Because I think I think there are two there are two other ways to think about all of this stuff. This is I think in general, not just specific for you. Sure. So one is the apprentice model. Yeah. So I I think I am a big fan of an apprentice model of learning. Mm-hmm. I think that it's um, it, so it, it's alive and well in the sciences. Mm-hmm. So. So at least it's a hybrid model. So if you go get a PhD at a, at a research university mm-hmm. in an area, you know, in the social natural sciences, you're going to take some coursework and you're going to get brutalized by it. It's just the nature of that thing. But you'll, you'll also be working usually, if, you know, closely with more senior people, mm-hmm. um, at first doing the kind of grunt work similar to being a apprentice in, um, you know, up as a plumber, for example. Yeah. 
And then as you get more and more experience and skill and, and show that you can do it, you, you get asked and have the opportunity to do more challenging, more creative kind of work until sure. one day your mentor places his or her hand on your shoulder yeah. and says, you got it. You can go do this on your own grasshopper. Yeah. Right? Like that kind of thing. So that, you know, I, I don't know if, um, I don't know how easy or hard it is to find a, a mentor in, in the arts. Yeah. Um, the, the other way to do it, I think, is to piece it together. Yeah. You know, and, and the beautiful thing now is, you know, all the knowledge is mm -hmm. out there and accessible. Very much so. So then it's a matter of, can you curate it? Mm -hmm. And then do you have the discipline to systematize consuming it? Yes. You know, uh, Coursera classes, Khan Academy classes, YouTube, books, yeah. podcasts. I mean, et I, meetups, et cetera. There's so business. much. I mean, like, yes. I, I wish that I had known more about that, uh, as a possibility, but I did teach myself about stand up that way. I worked day jobs where I could have headphones in all day and I would just binge all of these podcasts, listening to comics, talk about comedy. And I, I, this is true of a lot of comics of my generation. And then like in this period of time, there's been a slew of books written by female comics. Mm. Um, and so I've just been, I've pretty much have listened to, to all of those as well. And, and I feel like my, my friend, Crystal Adams, who has a podcast called too sensitive for comedy. Um, she talks about this, but like kind of podcasts are, the mentor now, you know, like that's mm. our, all of our mentors. So there isn't really apprenticeship or mentorship. You know, there might've been a time when somebody would be like, Oh, you funny comic come open for me on the road. But that really doesn't happen as mm -hmm. much anymore. Yeah. So, Cause these openers are in the towns and so mm -hmm. on. It's more cost effective. Yeah. So what are, I, I, um, so this is usually my last question, but it seems like I should ask it now, which is, what are those things that you are listening to reading or watching that have, that are really, really good? Okay. So the book that I probably have listened to the most, cause I, I could read a book, but like I, I also drive Lyft. So I listen to stuff and like I, you know, do and whatever. So the book that I've listened to repeatedly is Joan Rivers, uh, inter talking. Mm -hmm. Love that book. Wait, what's it called? What is it? Again? Joan Rivers, mm -hmm. inter talking. Okay. That's her first book. It's about the period of time of when she just before she's starting stand up to when she does Carson. Okay. And so, and it kind of like shows like her life. And I really love that book. I recommend it for anybody who's like, um, female, female identified or queer to like, listen to that book as like a good, a good one. Um, I really loved Whitney Cummings book. Um, which I think is called everything is fine, but I could be wrong. Okay. <laughs> I love that one. And, um, miss Pat's book I thought was also good. Uh, miss Pat's book was called rabbit and that's about her life as a, uh, teenage mother drug dealer, uh, who then turned it around and became like a national headlining comic. And, you know, how to deal with NBC and a TV show and all this other stuff. But it was just very interesting. And I have to imagine inspiring given your mm -hmm. background. Yeah. Yeah. And Tiffany Haddish's book as well. Oh uh, yeah. I'm um, reading that right now. Black unicorn. That is a little bit harder for me to get through sometimes because it's, you, you know, it, it just is. It's difficult. Why um, so? Tell me why. I'm about two thirds of the way through it. Oh, just like, the, you know, just like the day to day, like the real nitty gritty of like what it's like to grow up poor and without like her situation was a little, was definitely worse than mine. Mm -hmm. But like, just like when she explains like the stuff that happens with her mom and her mom being, you know, brain injured and like yes. that kind of stuff, like that's the stuff that kind of like gets me a little bit. And so that, that's so just hard. Painful. Yeah. It's very painful for me to listen to, but mm -hmm. Talk about um, authenticity mm -hmm. that's on display in that mm -hmm. book. Yes, it's it's great. And also, like, 
she's somebody who, you know, her career will probably look like mine, like, or I hope, which is like, we all knew who she was, you know what I mean? In comedy. And then now all of a sudden she's a household name. Her face is on billboards and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. So I looked at people like her and I'm like, she's not mentoring me directly. I met her. I know, you know, I know of her obviously, but like, I look to her as a mentor. I look to Whitney Cummings as a mentor. I look to Joan Rivers as a man- mentor, Miss Pat as a mentor, Christella Alonzo. Uh, her book is coming out later this year and it's going to be in English and Spanish. And I can't wait to read that, you know, cause I relate to Christella's story so much as well. So, you know, I look to these women to see like what they've, uh, what they've accomplished and where they've come from and kind of like, you know, just you get on with it, mm-hmm. you know, it's very powerful stuff. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear this list of books because I think, um, with the exception of Joan Rivers and a few, you know, there mm-hmm. weren't many resources yeah. if you were a young female comic Yeah, you know, in terms of looking for the inside information about about this and seeing like, Oh, well, you know, we come from similar places Mm -hmm. and and so on. It's there. Yeah. Finding the, the, the similarities between us all. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, okay. A few other things that I want to chat about. So, um, have you, do you have your note, your, your notebook? Ah, so this is a, this is a change. Um, I recently switched from notebook to digital. You did. I did. So tell me, I'm an analog guy. Mm-hmm. So I, I was for many years. I love pens and paper. I'm, I'm sitting I here with a stacks of the same notebook in my cam- shelf, a Cambridge yellow legal pad and so on. And so you have switched over to your phone. So tell me, tell me why. Um, I did it in preparation for the album to get everything ready for that. It was just, um, also, I was just like, I'm concerned that if I'm going to lose these, you know what I mean? If I'm going to keep them forever or what, I don't know what's going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. But digitally, I I also keep like, I guess I should say I keep all my like, because I do a lot of submission for like writing jobs and stuff. And so I keep all my like scraps and notes for writing packets Mm -hmm. in my Google drive. I see. And I can pretty much call upon any, any of them from the last five years and pull from them. If I need like a, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to need a plug and play joke. I just need the beginning and the middle and I can just fix it. You know what I mean? Like with the subject or whatever. Okay. Um, or do I have a joke about this person? I think I do. I remember writing a joke about this person. I, I have it in my Google drive. So I was like, I should do that with my other jokes. I see. So then it's just easier for me to like, Recall them, pull them up, or whatever. And the permanency. Yeah. God forbid there's a fire or something like uh-huh. that kind of thing. I but, keep toting around all this shit, like from apartment to apartment, but it's like this could be digital. Yes. You know, there's these, um, it's more of a European phenomenon than it is a US phenomenon at this point, this, this idea of digital nomad ship. Mm. So these are people who either sell everything they own mm-hmm. or stick it in storage somewhere sure, and then live in the world with a bag, Mm -hmm. a laptop and a phone. Yeah. And, um, you know, when it's, when it's winter in Europe, they go to Bali and when it's summer, they go to Berlin, you Mm -hmm. know, or Stockholm and, and, uh, you know, they are, you know, they're working, you know, they're the digital part of the nomad ship is important, right? Sure. So they're working in a, in, they can work anywhere, so to speak, as long as they have internet access. Yeah. And so there is something about lowering your overhead, not just, you know, not, not, not just like not having stuff that you have to pay for a car payment or a house payment or something, mm-hmm. but like truly lowering your overhead so that you, own almost nothing. Yeah. Which then allows you to be flexible, light, fast, Mm -hmm. and live relatively cheaply. Right. Um, Free. And so this is, this is in that vein. Yes. Yeah. So let's, let's finish by chatting about something early. If you don't mind, I can understand if you wouldn't want to talk about it, but. Oh, like something that I haven't finished. Yeah. Something you're kind of noodling on and I'm working working on. Yeah. She's like, she's scrolling through her phone right now. I am now. scrolling through my phone. Yes. Um, 
Sorry, I'm just looking through something. Uh, this like, is, I'm sorry, I'm just checking my email right now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm texting. <sighs> um, I uh, I have been talking about class slowly, so I've been talking about um, my day jobs, um, which. You know, for many years, I was a property manager Mm. as well as I drove Lyft. But now I'm sort of like driving Lyft and not working in property management because it was too much of a time commitment. The nice thing, you know, the fascinating thing about Lyft in this city, first of all, Lyft, Uber, etc. Make this city much more livable. Mm -hmm. You know, you could live anywhere in the city now. You can live anywhere. You don't have to have a car. You don't have to have a car in the city. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's just the parking is half the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody talks about the traffic, but really the parking is just as much of a problem. Yeah. And so, and then the other beautiful thing is it fits perfectly for the aspiring entertainer. Yeah. Right. You work when you want to work. You can turn it off once you get an audition. You know, you... It's freeing in that sense. I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not suggesting it's great work. No, but if I could be doing something else, I would. Sure. But it's, it's certainly, it's going to change come January though, because the government's making it so that we're not 1099 employees. We're not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We're, we have to be employees now. Oh, I didn't know that. So I don't know how that's going to change Lyft and Uber, but for the moment until then. I'll worry about that then. Yes. So I've just been talking about like this, like work stuff and like this idea that somebody recently, uh, somebody who I respected sat me down and spoke about me myself and another comedian and was like, this person is so fun on stage. What are you having fun? Do you have fun when you're mm-hmm. performing? I'm like, that person owns a home. You know what I mean? Like I am housing and food insecure. So sorry if I'm not like, you know, bright eyed, bushy tailed every time I go on stage and they're like, well, and I'm like, I, I get that. It's like, again, class has just been coming up a lot for me lately. And it's like, I literally don't have money, you know, like I, I am like putting things off because I'm like, I can't afford it. I'm Mm -hmm. like, you know, very living in a scarce moment in my life. And so it's, it's difficult to be. And also that's kind of not the comedy that I do. I'm not like, fun, you know, your best friend at the party. I'm kind of like your shitty mean coworker, you know what I mean? Like a a little bit, but, um, so yeah, so I have like two notes in here. I should combine them into one, but, um, what did you want to know about these? I don't know. I just think, I think it's fun to, uh, my bias is I'm actually less interested in the final joke and more interested in the premise and development. So, so it sounds like your premise is, is about this idea of, why I'm not fun. Why you're not fun. Yeah. And it's because I work two jobs. I mean, the the start of the chunk, I'm going to, I'm building it out right now, but it's like, um, I drive Lyft and I'm a proper, I'm, I'm a property manager and I drive Lyft for a living because I love a white woman in crisis, <laughs> you know? And then it goes on to talk about this horrible tenant I had. And then, so now the second half, I'm trying to figure out the best Lyft story to plug into I see, it right. to kind of balance it out. But it's so the my process and this has been these jokes are kind of an offshoot of this idea on the premise but i'll like i mean you can scroll through it but oh, fascinating i like have a list of like why i'm not fun i go through like <laughs> i have like mental diarrhea i have a mental breakdown on the page so part of my part of my process anytime i write like jokes for like hold, hold on i just want to say this yeah. number three only men who want me love naz or have or slow swimmers so they can't trap me with a child. <laughs> <laughs> That's really very funny. That's dumb as shit. <laughs> I just like that those two things together in the same uh, yeah. uh-huh. I'm I so guess these I'm, are all the reasons you're not fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, my, my target bra underwire snapped in half and I don't have $20 to replace yes. it. So you're like brainstorming all Yeah. These, I'm just like, like what are the, the, the reasons? funny things? I'm not having that, fun because an underwire is stabbing my boob. Yeah. You know, like I would be funner if my boobs were fully supported. Right. Uh, but then, so I have that, but then I keep like trying to like crack the premise. So I'll like start a thought. Like if you scroll through it, you can see like, I'll, I'll repeat a thought. Yeah. Or, like, you have Deb, you have, um, debt and then you have bad credit 
right? Yeah. Back to back. And I'm like trying to get there. And then like lower on that, on that page, I also will. So part of the thing wow. that I do is yeah. I will like make a list of like just points, but then I'll also like, we'll set a timer and mm-hmm. just like word vomit for 20 or 15 minutes uh-huh. and just like try to think of like all the things that I like the rant, the rant that I would make if I were standing on the corner. Yeah. Like You're a like crazy a fucking woman. Of course I'm not fun. Yeah. I didn't get to take a car nap in between leaving my day job and showing up to the show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's fascinating. You know, I, I, you know, that idea of setting a timer, I, I, mm-hmm. I've heard a number of times. I had a comic on here, a friend of mine named Shane Moss. Who, oh, okay. He uses something called write or die. Oh, yeah. Are you familiar with write I or do. die? That is so scary. <laughs> Woo. Yeah. So, Shane's so brave. <laughs> he, you know, Shane, Shane is, Shane's a good ro- joke writer and he's committed to doing it. Yeah. He, you know, he or believes you in lose that. lose it? Yeah. Well, there's these different levels. So, okay. So, for the listener, write or die is a website. You can go and use this program Mm -hmm. and you set basically you set a timer and you set a word count that you're trying to hit and so if you're on pace to hit the word count it rewards you it kind of like makes like nice sounds and ding Mm -hmm. you know kind of thing but if you're if you slow down too much the screen starts to flash and it starts to make like negative sounds sure but there's like some sort of like terminator mode or something i can't remember annihilator mode or something i can't remember what it is which is that if you if you're not, if you start missing your goal, it starts to delete the stuff that you. Horrifying. <laughs> I'm like a hoarder when it comes to, I keep all the scraps. Yeah. You were saying this. I keep all the bits, the half sentence, the, uh, the, uh, all the versions of it. I want to keep them because I, I, that terrifies me. I could see that. I, I'm not quite there yet either. I'm, I also am bad at doing the, the word vomit. Yeah. I, I'm too meticulous. So mm-hmm. I want to edit and clean and make things pretty and yeah. use words in fun kind of ways, which obviously there's a place for that, but it's not, not when you're developing something new. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I hope that your why I'm not fun bit. Yes. Comes into something, becomes something. <laughs> yes. I also hope that. Uh, like Bruce Springsteen Mm -hmm. and Tiffany Haddish and Mm -hmm. all these other folks that um, you, you get to a level of success that then becoming fun is, is more more of an option. Yeah. Decide. All right. It's time to be, I love it. Time to be. Um, That's great. Well, Madison, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me, Peter. This is dope. It was super interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit petermcgraw.org for more information about our guest, show notes, and social media links. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with others. Join Dr. Peter McGraw.